Welcome, everybody. This is a podcast uh, about the active electrical cables from Molex. Uh, my name's David Pike. I'm known as Connector Geek around the industry, and I'm here to ask some questions about this interesting and exciting new product. The growth in the demand for high-speed internet seems to be relentless. We all seem to want to be able to connect to the internet much quicker than ever before. Almost every device that you can think of is connected to the internet now in one way or another which means that the data center is the key infrastructure for the internet. This is the thing that's going to be powering the internet in the future. And this rise in data and this need for extremely high speed signals means that we simply can't use the connectivity technology that we used to use 10 years ago. It just isn't going to be up to the job. So I'm here to talk about some new solutions. I'm joined today by Vivek Shah and Chris Kapazinski. Hi, guys. Hey, David. Hello. Chris and Vivek are Speciality guys from Molex, and they're here to talk to us today about the AEC product and how it fits in. So welcome, chaps. And um, talking specifically about data centers, uh, it's not just about providing a quicker service for your smartphone. Uh, data centers are going to be crucial for the way businesses run in the future. How is this next generation of data center going to cater for these enterprise needs? Sure. This is Chris. I'll jump in on that. So you're right. Uh, yes, the marketplace is absolutely demanding faster and faster speeds, more and more data. You see this across uh, not only your smartphone, but across uh, other connected devices, as you're mentioning. Even your televisions, as we move from standard definition to high definition, 4K and even 8K, all of this, especially with people streaming more and more content, uh, is really putting a significant load on the network. And so many designers uh, are looking to see how can we get more bits faster bits uh, to the customer again as rapidly as possible. And so we in the industry are seeing this evolution from 25 gigabit speeds to 56 gig to 112. Uh, we're also talking about 224 gigabits per second. Revamping, as you're mentioning, the way in which the data center kind of delivers that sort of capacity is going to be critical if we're going to deliver upon the demands in the marketplace. The AEC cables that we'll be talking about here shortly are an integral element within that strategy going forward. Um, they really do help couple a number of the other innovations uh, that are being done from a, a connector perspective to enable a full turnkey sort of solution when it comes to the data center and the increased speeds that the market is, is demanding. And I, I keep hearing about terms like high signal integrity and, and low latency. What are they in terms of the kind of connectivity that we're trying to provide here? Yeah, this is Vivek. Let me get that one. When we talk about signal integrity, we want to ensure that uh, the signals that is generated by one of the transmit side silicon chips is received well on the other side and the other receiver side is able to detect it correctly. And so as the speeds start increasing, uh, the need for the higher bandwidth arises the signal tends to degrade a little bit more as we go in higher in speeds and frequencies. And so to ensure that we have a good signal integrity is becoming more and more challenging with the traditional interconnect solutions. AEC is one of those solutions that can solve some of the challenges that we face uh, with the signal integrity with the passive DAC or some other uh, architectures that are in place. And what sort of challenges, the, we talked about the challenges that the, the data centers and data center managers are going to have to, to provide. We're talking about speeds here. You mentioned anything up to 224 gigabits a second. That's nearly a quarter of a terabit a second over, what's that, a single channel or a pair of channels? What kind of challenges is this presenting to, to the guys trying to make the data centers to run these things? Yes, so at 224 gigabits per second, it's on a single lane. The expected Nyquist frequency is 53 gigahertz. So when, when someone's talking about um, 112 and even 224 gigabits per second, there's a fair amount of challenges uh, in the data center, making sure how they're gonna connect these various uh, systems, whether it's the uh, network of uh, different switches uh, connected uh, with each other, or it's from the top of the rack switch to the servers. The how to uh, cool these systems is also becoming a challenge because the need for the power is increasing um, as we uh, go to these higher speeds. And also along with that, the cost. The cost is also going up 
because you have to use the high-end either PCB materials, the interconnect components, the chip costs. So overall, as a need for the data increases, uh, the data center architect uh, needs to think about the performance, the signal integrity performance, uh, the cost, and as well as the thermal uh, performance requirements um, and how they can support it for those higher needs. That's really interesting because the, the thermal needs are something that, that people might not necessarily think of immediately when they're thinking about data centers. Sure, we, we know that there's, there's racks of machines in lovely air conditioned buildings, but the amount of energy, the amount of power that's being put through these things, it, it's mind boggling to think how much of that energy is being converted into heat. So you mentioned different materials for things like PCBs. Talking about the AEC product itself, how's that? What is the AEC product? What does it look like? And how does that help with things like thermal management? Yeah, David, this is Chris. I can jump in on that one. So a couple of things uh, from a thermal management perspective that the AEC is going to help contribute. Uh, but before I actually uh, address that, let me kind of step back and kind of paint a, a physical picture, right? If you, if you imagine a rack in your head where you've got a, a top of rack switch at the top, servers down below, uh, traditionally, your longest length cable to be able to connect that server to the top of rack switch may be three meters. But as we move to the faster and faster speeds um, and we move to that higher frequency, the traditional sort of passive cables that used to be able to reach three meters are no longer capable. Uh, now, those traditional cables might only be able to get you uh, a meter and a half or two meters. Uh, so what are you going to do for those longer length reaches? And that's really where an AEC comes in. The beauty about an AEC, and to directly answer your question about thermals, is because the AEC is utilizing a retimer to basically recondition uh, the signal, it can now utilize a, a smaller twin X. And so the cable bundle, the physical cable mass of that uh, AEC can actually be reduced. That has some significant benefits to the people implementing uh, these rack architectures. Number one, the, the cable is easier to route within the overall chassis, within the overall system. And because the cable mass is actually less, there's less thermal impedance, there's less airflow impedance uh, passing basically over or through those cables uh, to basically ultimately make its way through the chassis. And so by utilizing these smaller bundles of twin X, we can actually more efficiently cool from a system level perspective, the servers and the switches uh, within that rack. Yeah, that's a good point. Simply less mass means you've got things like higher surface area if you're talking about airflow and making things easier to cool down. And the routing is going to have to be a benefit in terms of being able to route the cables more efficiently. So at each end, so we've got these very thin or, or relatively thin twin axe cables. At each end, what does the AEC product look like? Is it something that we'd be familiar with in terms of other technologies? Yeah, absolutely. It is. So there's many different form factors that it could come in. QSFP, double density, QSFP, OSFP. So all of the standard industry uh, form factors that architects are accustomed to utilizing, uh, whether that be you know four lanes, eight lanes, all of that is possible. It is standard MSA compliant form factors at both ends of the cables. And that could just be a simple straight cable where it may be double density QSFP on one end, double density QSFP on the other, or if an architect wishes to do more of kind of a breakout scenario where it's QSFP on one end, two QSFPs on the other, uh, that is certainly possible. So basically many of the same sort of cable architectures and form factors that the industry has relied upon are able to be utilized here. Again, it's, it's MSA compliant. So does that mean it's backwards compatible? Is it a case that rather than having to rip out the entire infrastructure, architects could upgrade their system almost piecemeal? Absolutely. Without a problem, you may not get the 112 gig performance, depending upon what the connector is that you're plugging into. But yes, it is reverse compatible. 
that's really interesting for these guys it means that they they can start to utilize some of the qualities that this is going to provide them without having to take that huge hit in terms of installation cost or, or downtime of replacing racks and racks of machines it's a, an ability for them to start creating almost hot spots you know, making areas of the data center perform better and, and then expand that is is that a, a correct way of describing it Yes, it, it provides kind of a gradual evolution. It's not a, a full rip and replace. They can still rely upon the standard form factors that they have been accustomed to. Fantastic. And there was another word that I've read in terms of in connection with the AEC products. We're talking about reach. Are we specifically talking about the reach in terms of distance between server and switch or, or server and server? Is, is that the way that we're using that word? Yes, whether we are talking about within a rack or even between racks, yes, reach is a physical length, whether it be two and a half, three, five, or even seven meters, you know, depending upon uh, how far you need to get within the rack or between racks. In terms of this high speed product, this is a, this is certainly a new area to me. So um, the fact that these AEC products are both able to be used with existing infrastructure and provide people with uh, additional performance or should somebody want to they can go the whole hog and uh, install a system that will be able to take advantage of the the full 112 gigabits maybe even 224 in, in the, the near future um, this AEC product is going to be powering these data centers which seem to be springing up everywhere is this something that's being installed now is this something that we are seeing uh, in place at the moment yes so there are different kinds of applications for an active electrical cable one of the application is just from the reach perspective which is uh, which is needed for the high speed of 112 or beyond which is not really being deployed anywhere today but then there is a class of active electrical cables called as a smart co cables, uh, basically which has a little bit of more of a functionality just then uh, trying to reach, uh, get to a, a longer reach. These cables are used for redundancy, for switching over between one uh, top of the rack switch to the other top of the rack switch. So it's a re redundant to top of the rack switch connected to each server, where if one of the switches goes down for any reason, you can switch over to the other one. And those type of smart cables are being deployed today in the industry. Okay. Now there's there's one more question that I'm I'm going to ask before we we wrap up. We're talking about active electrical cables, and um, we're talking about smart cables. Those words to me mean that they require power. How much power are these these cables using, and how is that utilized? Yeah, so the power kind of varies depending on what kind of uh, technology is used inside. The linear amplifier tends to be less power hungry. Something with the read timer is more power hungry. So you can have um, a power ranging from anywhere between two watts to 12 watts. It also depends on the form factor because it drives also the number of channels that are required for these form factors. So it's a huge range of, uh, for the power requirement. But that power does give you, it brings you this, this higher speed, it brings you this reach and to provide additional performance. I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I've learned an awful lot about both the, the high speed application and about the AEC product. So I'm going to say, Chris Vivek, thank you so much for that. Um, in the next podcast, uh, we're going to look at how AECs perform in comparison with other technologies. Uh, in terms of some of the technologies that they are replacing and why you might choose an AEC product to where there are sometimes you might not. So that's the subject of our next podcast. I want to say a big thank you to Chris and to Vivek. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. And thank you everyone for listening and we'll speak to you again soon.